Okay, hi everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, this talk is going to be uh, about my journey in game development over the last two years and how I learned to be an advocate for the story um, and how I went from a traditional writing background um, and my, my journey into game development um, and the challenges I met along the way and the skills I've learned to help me uh, be a better narrative designer. Um, and I'm going to use the Gardens Between as an example because I find it much easier to talk about writing and story and narrative design with a concrete example. So I'm going to talk about the project um, and talk about how I tackle challenges that way. But also um, as a way of, I guess, showing process because I as a creator am inherently interested in other people's processes because it's always different or there are similar things or if you, you get some ideas from what someone else does in order to be creative and can apply it in your own practice. So that's the other reason for this kind of setup. So um, I'm also doing this because um, so writers can see how I've been working if you're a writer in the room or a narrative designer. Um, are there people, writers and narrative designers in the room? Yep, awesome. People who just love storytelling in general, excellent. Great, great. So hopefully this will be applicable to all of you, um, but also see the challenges that I faced and to also show that I'm still learning as well. Um, so I've always wanted to write for games. Um, when I was little, I had a Super Nintendo and I had Mario Paint with Mouse and I made little sprites um, as using the stamp tool and then I would use those sprites, those little characters and then I made so like maybe a boy one and a girl one and a horse one and then one that was like rainbow magic because I loved Rainbow Bright at the time. So I would tell Rainbow Bright stories to my little sister and we would both sit in front of the TV and I would tell her a story using those sprites and sort of animating them and moving them around as best as you could do with that game at the time. Does anyone remember Mario Paint with Mouse? It's like... Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Okay, so that's my background, sort of where it started. And then I remember I went to a, a PAX or something and saw um, the writers from Bioshock talking. And I was like, oh, I, I really loved that game and that story. And I went and asked them and said, how do you be a game writer? Um, and they said, <laughs> the one bit that I can remember was, well, um, you know, just do a lot of writing. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool, I can, I can totally do that, <laughs> sure. But the, it wasn't as easy as that, but also um, that has been something that has helped me a lot by, you know, writing what I like to write and putting it out there has inevitably made me a better writer and generated a body of work that has landed me where I am today. Um, and why I can possibly show an introductory slide like this one. Okay, hello, I'm Brooke. I'm a writer, narrative designer and producer and I love storytelling. I just co-founded a company called Burning Glass Creative that offers game design, narrative design and production services to games and other creative industries. So this is something that's very dear to me. Um, my background is I did a multimedia degree thinking I was going to be a web developer and that didn't work out so much with the in-business learning year. I realised that wasn't what I wanted to do at all and got to the end of my degree and went, oh God, what do I do? <laughs> um, I took some electives in creative writing and loved them. So I went and studied professional writing and editing after that, which was a more skills-based course about um, you know, editing work and writing for film, writing short stories, writing novels, and where I really learnt the craft of storytelling from authors who were already writing and publishing their books um, and editors who were working in industry already. Um, and then after that, I didn't have enough of creative writing, so I went and studied an honours degree in creative writing at Deakin, um, which was the complete opposite. It was a lot of theoretical applications um, and, you know, ideas about literature in general and how, you know, we study the telling of story. So where one was a more practical application, one was also um, more applying philosophy to writing. And I wrote um, a novella and then a, an exegesis describing that. 
Um, so then during that time I was teaching at Swinburne, teaching game design, user experience design, project management and cultural studies at university. So I have a teaching and communication background as well. Um, so two years ago I would have told you that I teach at university and I'm writing a novel um, and I'm not teaching at university anymore and I'm still writing that novel. Uh, so I'm sure some of the writers in here can um, relate to. But um, so The Gardens Between was my first opportunity to write for games and I was beyond excited. Um, I was recommended um, after a twisted fairy tale that I had written. Um, at the time, the prototype for the gameplay of the game was based around Little Red Riding Hood because it was a very sort of clear execution of story. Um, and the Voxels wanted to tell a more original story and they reached out to someone outside of the industry to do writing for them. And it was their first narrative-driven game, their first adventure puzzle game, and first time with a writer in-house. Um, so it was a bunch of firsts for everyone, which is also why I think this is a good example to, to talk from. Um, so, writing for games, as I imagined it. I thought I would be writing a script, I thought uh, branching dialogues, modular storytelling, choice-based interactions, you know, with Bioshock clearly in my mind, Vampire the Masquerade being one of the things that I absolutely love and just thinking, oh, you know, this is going to be, this is going to be interesting. I don't think it's going to quite be as big as those things, but I think it's, it's going to be a bit similar. Um, so I was like, cool, the gardens between script. Actually, there is no script. We're telling a story with no text or speech. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was like, OK, cool. There are a few reasons for that. Um, it's a, it was, a, well, it is a smaller project with a smaller team. Um, the tight timeline and budget means um, we don't necessarily have the length and breadth for translation, for getting voice actors, for doing, you know, a, a huge narrative back-end system for the game. Um, but also we wanted to make a game that was, that didn't have language barriers, that was accessible, um, that, uh, you know, didn't um, rely on a lot of reading, so, so younger um, players could play as well. So there are a lot of artistic and sort of more pragmatic reasons for that. Um, but it certainly set up a lot of challenges across the board for the team. It means that game design doesn't have text to explain how to play. There are no written instructions. And also narrative doesn't have dialogue um, or speech or anything like that to, to tell the story. Um, so you can imagine that like things that I love like Dragon Age, I'm like, yes, like can you choose your dialogue in this game? Yeah, let's not get too excited. That's not going to happen. Um, could we write text on the screen? Final Fantasy VIII being one of my uh, loves of all time. Uh, no, we can't do that either. Okay, cool. So what are some other ways that we can tell story? I want to throw it to you guys for a minute. Do you believe that this tells a story? Yeah. Yes. Can someone tell me what the story might be? That a couple of people out at the night. Yeah. yeah. Are they having a good time or are they? They seem to be having a good time. It's obviously night and it's raining. Yep. It's a love story. It's a love story. Why is it a love story? Yep. Underneath the same umbrella. They don't have separate umbrellas. They're sharing a shelter. Their relationship is creating a rainbow of colours in the environment. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, the colours around them suggest what is going on between them. Yes. Anything else? The weather. Yeah, the weather. Yep. They're by themselves. They're by themselves. Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. Two children. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I see. No, I was just like. Okay, well, thank you very much. I mean, you, you get my point. We can do this. We can tell some sort of story without using text or speech. Um, and working out how to do this in our game 
uh, has definitely been a process, but been a really interesting one. So how did I begin? To find the themes and creative vision of the game, we jammed with concept art, basically. So um, our artist, Jonathan Swanson, um, would do these amazing uh, concepts, you know, showing and depicting these characters, and I would write character profiles for them. I would write short stories for them, um, brainstorming what the world might be like, what's going on between them, who are they? Um, we didn't necessarily start out with the idea that they knew each other originally. Um, do they, you know, what is the nature of their relationship and also what's the nature of their journey? But also between us all as a team, what was the kind of story that we were interested in telling? So um, this sort of calls back to Emily and Katie's talk yesterday about creative vision. We were very much charting the course here and figuring out what we wanted to put into our game and what this game was going to be about. So um, we agreed overall, we wanted the game to be about friendship. We wanted the game to be about growing up. We wanted the game to be bittersweet. And the reason being is because it has a fairy tale quality to it, um, but we didn't just want to tell another happily ever after fairy tale either. And it, it sort of, kind of has fairy tale elements, but is not going to be a fairy tale necessarily, if that makes sense. So um, we had that, you know, idea, but and at the same time, we were thinking about the game design and how we were going to show these levels and what they were going to be made of. We've since decided not to go with very many s structural elements in the environment, but this was certainly a test to see how that would look and feel. Um, so. We also decided that the gameplay would be slow, meditative and observational, um, so it doesn't rush players. Again, with our um, ambition of you know, appealing to a wider range of players who are perhaps younger or older or parents who want to play with their kids. Um, it, there's no time limits on solving these puzzles. Um, the music will not be you know, rushy or dramatic. So we were quickly establishing an idea of what we wanted this game to be, but also how to provide uh, notions of level progression here. So this um, concept is of a world map and we were thinking about how players could, you know, figure out where they were in the game and have an idea of their own progression, but also how that progression added to the story. So this inherently, this landscape has an increasing level of drama to it. Um, so I just want to show you um, what, what the game looked like originally, what to start with. I hope this is going to work. Yes. And this is an example of a physical puzzle in the environment. So you slide your finger on the screen to move the characters back and forth in time. And for a long time, it was called The Time Project. Um, but we since found a title for it, which is great. So when I was writing these stories with these concept images, um, I was, ooh, excuse me, I need to find a way to make this. There we go, great. Um, I was finding a way to convey the story uh, to the rest of the team. You know, I was writing a lot of short stories and a lot of world documents. They were very text heavy. There was probably 10, you know, 20 pages in one at some stage. Um, and when I was going into brainstorming meetings, you know, to talk about the story, um, I was very much coming from my background um, in literature and, and storytelling and writing and editing where I just popped out from. And, um, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, um, the whole of a story has a beginning, middle and end. And I wanted to talk about things like um, Robert McKee and, um, you know, a character's wants and desires and thinking about the hero's journey and Joseph Campbell. And um, I had all of these concepts in mind. So what is the story question? What is the conflict? What about a character's outer desire versus their inner desire? What a character wants is not always what a character needs. What is the metaphor of the story? How do we show theme with metaphor? What is the motivation of these characters? Um, 
And that kind of language was seemingly very much at odds with the game that we're trying to make. We're trying to make something that's stress-free, peaceful, calm, accessible, friendly to non-gamers. And, you know, what is this storyteller doing in the room talking about drama and conflict? How, that's just not going to happen, you know. How, how do we get that through? Um, and I found that using that language um, was... Um, when I was conveying story, it, it wasn't aligning or seemingly not aligning with the creative vision of the team um, or addressing how we do any of this needs, wants and desires in the game itself, so how we actually show those things. So that video clip that I showed you doesn't tell much of a story. It shows gameplay, but why are they going up that mountain? What are they doing? Who are they? How did they get there? Um, so I was writing, for example, this is really, really, really early stuff. I think this is about 2014 that I was writing. You know, we had this idea that it was going to be about gods or, and then we were thinking about the differences between player goals, um, their motivations and character motivations um, and, you know, what their internal and external conflicts are. So. Initially, what I was running up against very first of all was that, quite obviously now, a player's motivation is different to a character's motivation, potentially. Um, why you're playing the game is different to why Arena and Friend are scaling that mountain. What keeps you playing is the story question potentially. What are they doing? Where are they going? Um, and then what um, motivates you as a player is different, but also what rewards you as a player might be different too and how to show the progression of a player and characters can be different. Um, and I found that I wasn't necessarily covering off both of those things, so I created something like this to sort of show the team that I was considering both things. But I just want to stress that I was writing a lot. <laughs> like, this is what the Google Drive was starting to look like. It was like, story concept one, story concept two, draft, draft final, draft, 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 number two. <laughs> if you're a writer, you might know how you like rewrite things and label. It's like, yep, number one, re rewrite, rewrite two. Okay, this is the final, you know. <laughs> it's just like... Yeah, it, it gets pretty crazy. So I quickly, you know, tidied all that up and put it in a folder so the team didn't have to look at that. But um, yeah, uh, it was it was a, a long process, but I still hadn't breached, I guess, a good way to explain the story to the team and why these, um, I guess, pillars or ideas of storytelling are necessary and can translate to every kind of story and game. Just as a side note, I don't believe that a story needs conflict to be a story, but let's not let's not uh, talk about that. <laughs> so um, I'm very much aware, but uh, you know, as an adventure game, their adventure is therefore probably meeting some kind of adversity, and in order to tell a good story, we needed to keep it simple. But you can see that things were getting very complicated, um, so it was time to lift my head out of Google Drive. Um, and think about another way to tell story. So, um, Henrik, uh, the creative director and game designer, was prototyping some of these levels with Lego and he invited me to join in. Um, obviously, this level design is going to be a key way for us to tell story. They're small 3D environments that rotate as you navigate as a player. So the way that things are arranged in the level is important because of the way that the camera frames them. Um, so thinking about moving in a 3D space was really integral to telling the story. And so Lego prototyping um, was a good way to start. Um, and it was so much fun understanding the 3D space in this way, especially because the Lego that we had came in color-coded packages. So I was like, great, okay, pink and white and purple, what could this one be about? And I built a tower um, and, you know, had that um, fairy tale-esque, I guess, story behind it. Um, and so what I would do is I wrote a short story about this tower and about this girl in a tower and then this other girl who was like a, you know, mirror of herself who was like coming to save herself from the... T and then I condensed it with a poem because I find 
poetry, while I'm absolutely terrible at poetry, I'm not a poet by any means, but the form makes you condense the message of the story. It makes you be sparing and get to the core of something. Uh, and then what I would do is create a Spotify playlist for each of these Legos. And each of um, then after that, I would have little game design ideas that I would write down, maybe what a puzzle would look like, how a bridge would be drawn and dropped and um, how that might look from one side and then the other. So playing tricks with um, when you start off in the level, you can see something that you need to do by the time you get right around. Um, so we were thinking about, you know, those 3D spaces um, using these Lego prototypes. Um, and it was a really great way for me as a writer to figure out how this is happening in game and in engine. So if you're a writer, I highly recommend if you're on a game development team, getting into the prototyping process if it's appropriate. Um, because it really helped me start to think about the creative challenges of the other people on my team. Um, and, you know, perhaps all this Joseph Campbell, Aristotle stuff was a little bit full on. Um, and we just needed to think about the problems in front of us. Um, so it encouraged me to consider art direction, how puzzles might work with the theme, and how landscapes could convey mood. And so we as a team um, tested out if we could tell some kind of story and capture some kind of mood with our levels. So these are what we called high concept designs to see you know, if they have a different feel about them and what the characters might look like in the environment. So very much testing as we go along. Um, so I've actually uh, put these out of order. Um, can anyone tell me what you would sort of imagine to be the first scene in a story? Green one? Yes. Great. Number one. What's number two? Yeah, pink and orange. And then number three being the storm. So it's interesting that although I've not really told you the story, you can see a, an order. There is a sort of natural progression to these things. So that's good. We felt like we could convey some kind of mood. We could convey some sort of progression of adversity in that way. So we were feeling good. It works. Okay, good. But then I knew I had to tell a story out of all of this. So these level design packages were a bit complex. So I was telling you that story about the girl and her mirrors. Like, that's too complicated for this kind of game. How are we going to get that across? We don't have text or speech. And it could be, you know, a lot of effort would be put into conveying that kind of story. So um, what they did do, though, was, I guess, ground what we what stories we liked to tell and what stories we didn't. So the ones that were obviously hitting on friendship growing up um, and um, what was the other thing that I said, bittersweet, um, were the ones that stayed. So um, it was up to me then to decide why they're scaling the vertical land masses, how they got there, what their relationship is, and what is the causal link between these narrative progressions. Because usually in story, as you know, the, there's usually a causal link between what's happening for the main characters that, that pushes them along. You're never really shown anything too out of, um, out of scope of the particular story. Um, so the game needed a plot, needed some kind of structure. And I did end up turning to a traditional plot structure, but it was not the hero's journey. Um, it was The Voyage and Return, um, which is in Christopher Booker's book called The Seven Basic Plots. Um, and it really spoke to us because it allowed us to show a surreal fantasy world that didn't necessarily have to make sense. And it also gave us a good structure, which was, um, so in this particular model, um, Characters have a problem in a real world. They fall into a fantasy world that starts out to be absolutely beautiful and wonderful, and then it slowly becomes frustrating in some way, and then it becomes pretty much adversarial, and then they have to get out. And then when they come back to the real world, they have all the solutions and tools they need to solve the problem. And you'll recognise this structure across a number of different stories. These are all, this happens with Coraline, with Alice, 
in this particular interpretation of Alice in Wonderland, she has to marry a guy she just does not like. And then she runs away together herself, falls into Wonderland, overcomes the Red Queen and comes back ready to not marry this guy and instead take over her father's shipping company. It's slightly different to the book, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it works. <laughs> um, and The Wizard of Oz is a good example too because the film actually uses colour as a way to convey this, um, this process. So it starts out sepia, not very... Um, you know, pretty bland and boring as the real world generally is in this plot structure. And then as soon as Dorothy gets to Oz, it's bright and beautiful and colourful and the munchkins are dancing all around her and this is the fascination stage. And then by the end, the uh, film has turned dark, it's night time, even the soldiers around the witch's castle are blue um, and she has to quickly get out. So we have this structure then that was good for us because it helped explain a number of things that we were having trouble with. So explaining how Arena and Friend got into this world, it was easy just to sort of have them tumble in. And also the structure gave us clear briefs about how to show each narrative beat in the game. Um, and our artist John was able to work with a clearer vision. But this also gave us a language that we could use to talk about story together. So I could say, you know, in the fascination stage, and everyone would understand what that meant, um, as opposed to me saying tension, conflict, needs and wants, inner, out of desires, things like that. So we, we used this not only as a way to help solve some story problems, but as a way for the whole team to talk about the story together which was really important, um, especially because now I'm not writing a story by myself, you know, in a room of one's own. I'm writing a story with a group of people now. And uh, by the way, I'm not even writing the story. I'm designing the story with them. Um, most of what I write is to help contextualise the story for them. And, and even then, my story documents now, I don't write them, I write, I write dot points. Um, so we make it very, you know, fluid in that way. So then this allowed us to convey mood and narrative beats and things, but this is still a bunch of beats with a narrative scaffold. So we needed to still answer some more questions about what are they running away from? How do they get into these gardens? Um, fortunately, how do they get in is a problem, funnily enough, we're still trying to solve like how to show that, but we know that we need to show it at some point. So that can remain fluid and flexible as well. Um, so it's still my job to fill in these story questions. How was I going to do that? Around this time, I was working closely with the builds. I got set up in Unity and pushed grey squares around and tried to build my Lego in, in the engine to see what that felt like and dropped the little character models in and was like, yeah, that kind of looks like a story there. You know, um, it starts out flat and then it gets a bit steep and then they finally get to the top, sort of using almost the three-act structure to tell a, a level design story. Um, but this still wasn't helping me answer the questions I guess, about the story and how to pitch the story to the team. So I still had some thinking to do. I still had, I still had to come up with a good story to match this structure and to, match, um, to answer these questions. And then I was asked to produce for the team. Our team was growing and I was the main communicator uh, and it made sense. So... Um, <coughs> I was helping keep the project on track. I took a little break as things were being built, still thinking about the story, but then from a producer perspective, coming up and thinking about the team story. And for me, producing and narrative design are very much storytelling um, and are linked in that way. So where, what is the story the team's telling themselves about the project? What's the story of the project? What's the story of your place on the project? Um, what are your wants and needs as a person on the team? Um, uh, what's the conflict like in the team? Is it, you know, negative or is it a good positive conflicting discussion, you know, brainstorming and solving ideas? So at this point, though, when I had this story problem, um, I switched over a little bit to do a bit more production. So I was writing PR, I was writing text for the website, press kits, app store descriptions and so on. 
And so I was having a good idea then of the game as a product, of the game as um, something that I'm communicating outwards about, you know, uh, giving promises or describing what is in in, a, in an attractive way. Um, and that helps me think more about, you know, just what exactly we were making and presenting, um, you know, outwardly. So that was helping, you know, I was settling into this role and doing much of this already. And I recognized also becoming the producer allowed me to sit, it gave me license to sit with the team. In fact, I, I had to learn more about what they were doing because I had to keep them on track. So I was sitting with our programmer and asking him about what he was doing, um, how he was doing it and why and how the time works in our game and the implications of that and how the characters move in the scene. Um, I sat with our artist and talked about what he was doing with the shaders and why and how he was creating these beautiful, peaceful environments that were just a joy to be in and that was important to him. Um, and I got to sit with our game designer more often and understand puzzles and the puzzle language and how to introduce people gradually to the language of a puzzle and what is necessary. So players need feedback and how do they know that they're solving the puzzle in the right way. Um, so secretly and rather magically, um, the producer role was giving me more and more insight into A, what is passionate and important to the team about the game. So their creative desire or expression in the game, what they wanted. Um, and also more about how the game is being built. Um, and then I was getting more and more ideas of what was in my narrative toolbox, essentially, what I had to tell this story and what we had as a team to do very simply. So where early on I was proposing scenes where, um, and I've said this before a number of times about this game, where I, would, I wrote this um, scene where Arena slipped and Friend reached out and grabbed her at the last minute at the top of the mountain and then, you know, we get to see them hug and, you know, whew, you know, we feel for them in that moment. And that's a great storytelling moment. I was going for high drama. I was like, yes, this is going to be great. And when I spoke to Henrik about it, he said, yeah, this, this is good. Uh, we can probably do that once and it would just be a character lifting an arm like this. And I was like, okay, cool. We didn't have an animator on the team at the time and I totally didn't even take that into account and um, just went, right, so it better be a really good arm lift at some point. <laughs> He's like, yep, we better make, and maybe put it at the end of the game, that would be good. And I'm like, okay, yeah, big mistake early on. Um, and so having this producer role then allowed me to see where the limitations were, but also where the opportunities were. Um, and that really helped when it came to pitching my stories. Um, I knew what I had to do then. I needed to stop writing big documents and I needed to think about what was important to the team about the story, um, the kind of story we wanted to tell and what we have to tell the story. So I did what any producer does when they're ready uh, to you know, rally the team. I called a meeting. I booked the conference room, I brought everyone in, and I made a PowerPoint presentation. I was visual. And I pitched not one story concept, but two. So the teams could have options about how they felt about how these stories fitted. Um, so the story had to do with um, basically Arena and Frenta being separated. Arena is moving away from home. Uh, they don't want to be separated, so they run away instead. And then they run to a, a place where they want to take refuge and instead they fall into the gardens. And then they have to, well, initially fascinated by the gardens and then they gradually start becoming more and more unsteady and uneasy. And by the end of the game, when they pop out of the gardens again, they can accept their separation as friends. Again, that is kind of a loose story and you can execute on that in a couple of different ways. We really just have to convey them running away, um, how do they reconcile what they're doing, you know, their friendship essentially. So then we thought 
The gardens between, all of these gardens can perhaps be memories of their friendship between them, what's happened between them. And then um, I was saying in my pitch, you know, we can show that in a number of different ways. You know, do we have the characters go both ways? Do we have them in individual levels and show them separated in the gardens? Yeah, we could do that, but if we can't do that with game design, it's not crucial to the story to do that either. Um, so I pitched um, all the different phases of the voyage and return with little dot points here. You know, they're enamoured by the other world. Um, and when they collect their objects, I was playing with the idea of showing golems or big adult figures in the backgrounds of these gardens because it is adults that are separating them. Um, I used, more importantly, the concept art. I used the things that were in engine. I was using um, the game designer's images there of the Lego. Um, I was using um, the pictures that the team were putting up in Slack. So I was going, great, I'm going to include you. You know, I'm going to use what you're doing here to show you how I would like to tell the story. Um, and I did err on trying not to write too much on those slides. Um, it was really hard, but I did it. Um, and so I pitched the ideas about how all of these things could come together to tell the story. No more big scenes. Um, I used my experience making Lego prototypes, putting a few dot points on there, and using their artwork and including them and involving them and brought their creativity in to show how we could tell the story, which I believe was my, I guess, transition from being writer to now also being narrative designer, being that conduit and thinking about how to design story with the rest of the game development team. Um, so here's another example too. This is something that I put up in our office um, so that once we were agreed on the story, the two stories that I pitched, by the way, were two different endings for the most part. One was about more about accepting death and the other was more about accepting loss or distance. Um, because of the tone of the game, we decided distance was a better one um, and then we went from there. And so once that was decided, I put it up on the wall in the office. I didn't just leave the story hidden in Google Drive. So um, having that up there, first of all, as the storyteller is excellent because everyone can look and go, what's the story again? And then they can just look and see the general trajectory of the story that we're telling. Mind you, it can change and it does need to be updated and that's the writer narrative designer's responsibility. So they're the advocate for the story. They're keeping the story and updating it and making sure the rest of the team understands what the story is about and what the story is doing. Um, and having it up there um, is also a way of being visual and showing what we're making. So from a producer perspective, this was wonderful for me too because this was charting a vision. Um, fantastically, the story of the game can also be the trajectory, the vision of the game as well. So saying this is the story that we're telling can also help to be the story of the project. This is the game that we're making. This is what we're working towards. Ultimately, when you can see what you're working towards, you're happier and more motivated to do it. Um, and so an advocate really is a supporter, someone who speaks or writes in favour of something or someone. They're a champion and they know what things are important to defend and what things can be let go. So this structure is fantastic because it has flexibility. We can drop levels, we can move levels around, um, we can think about how we're going to show arena in front falling into this world. We originally had doorways, but we're not sure if that will work for the tone of the game. But the good thing is those things can change over time, but the story remains relatively intact. Um, and advocating for the story is about planting images in your team's mind of the story, getting what's in your head out and using it as a direction and inspiring them with it, essentially. Um, and 
that's what I was doing in that conference room showing those slides. I was like, this is what it could be about. This is the story, being more of a storyteller um, and as opposed to going, I just kind of wrote this thing and it's just in Google Drive. You could just read it and like tell me what you think. Um, instead, standing up going, I really believe this is a good story. Um, sure, we can change it in some places, but, you know, having more of a voice in the team, I suppose, um, and having it be, I guess, just as important as well. So some things I've learned about advocating for the story, and I am going to be a bit text heavy now. Um, so as I've said, be visual. Think about as a writer and as a narrative designer, how are you going to show this? I stopped writing things in documents for our artist and instead sat with him with a sketchbook between us. My stick figures are horrific and not great at all, but they helped think about how we can show. I was always saying, so it's really important that we show um, Arena and friend are really good friends. And he would be like, yep, cool. How do we show that? I'd be like, hmm, they could hug. Yeah, we can't do that. Okay. Uh, they could, you know, be sharing an object. Yeah, we probably could do that. Game design, are they sharing objects? Yes, they are. Okay, cool. So, yeah. And then it's that negotiation that happens in the team as well. So thinking about how your team communicates. Use artwork from the rest of the team if you can and examples from other stories as I've done today. Understand what you have to tell the story. So what's in your toolbox? Is it a choice-based narrative? Do you have dialogue? Do you not? Um, what are the scenes? A good idea um, as a writer if you're starting going, what has been built already for this game? So think about what you can use that's, you know, that other people have been working on for a long time. If they've set it on a boat, don't start writing stories about spaceships or houses or a forest, you know, obviously. But think about, you know, what, what you can use. Um, think more about more than one story concept and know what your function is. So, for example, as the writer or narrative designer, are you telling someone else's story or do they want you to come up with the story? Um, they can be two different responsibilities. Think about who the vision holder is for the story. So who says, yes, that is our story, no, that doesn't fit our story. Um, if you're writing the story for someone else and you're not that person with that responsibility, you need to find out who has that responsibility. Who says, yep, I like that as the story. Um, and if it's you, great. Um, if it's not, then you can, you know, talk to that person and understand what's important to them about a story and what the stories they want to tell. Um, Understanding how the game's described outwardly really helps. So, for example, if you come onto a writing project and there's already text on the website about what the story is going to be about, what the game is going to deliver on, what the experience is, um, you know, what's been mentioned on their Facebook, what's been mentioned on their Twitter, that can be really helpful. So you say, okay, so you're saying this about the story, you're saying this about the game, so that's important to you. Or I've noticed that you're saying this is a story about love and friendship. Um, cool, you know, and, you know, just be aware of how the product or story or story of the project is already being described outwardly. That can really help. Um, and think about how the story can be flexible. So um, I just wanted to show you something that I'm pretty proud of. Our team's done a great job and I wanted to show how far um, we've come sort of in terms of thinking about things. Whilst doesn't look super different, it, it really is in a way that um, the puzzle language is working, so there are things in the scene that you can see that relate to, um, to puzzles but also to story. I'm just going to play that again. There we go. Um, can I hit pause on that? No. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is testing out one character in a scene, um, Arena taking fire to the top of the mountain. Uh, we found this was a really great metaphor for lighting up these gardens that are essentially memories of friendship. So that worked really well with the game design for us. So there still isn't heaps of story in there, but it's getting closer. And when you start on a game project, think about if story is leading first or if game design is leading 
And essentially what happens is they're very symbiotic, but one will sort of lead with the other like this. And you can say, great, that's just come into game design, so narrative's going to do that, and then you can, you can craft it together. Um, and each game will be different because the balance is different between them. But I found that distinction really helpful. Um, so overall, I guess my point is sometimes um, story can feel missed by other disciplines. Um, but storytelling is also technical, it's iterative, and it's problem solving. It's hard. But it's about naming your variables, knowing your key functions of the story and understanding the if-else statements of your characters. And then you can explain to the team why they're important and where the flexibility is in their systems. And I'm sorry to any programmers in the room if I got that wrong. Um, so I might just not give you a blank screen. I'm going to just play this again. <laughs> um, so. Uh, thinking about how the story language and the puzzle language re relate to the game was important to me. And once I came to that, I realised that a narrative designer is more about knowing about each role and what each person is capable of. Creating the story is intensely personal, which makes conceiving of it um, in a group of creative people tricky. Um, but knowing who the vision holder, who says yes, is important. Um, but also understanding that a story can be told in many different ways, which gives it many different themes. How you tell a story can be intensely personal, and it's a, but it's a conscious decision made for someone else. So how did I tell story, you know, to my sister with those sprites in Mario Paint with Mouse? It was literally the same story of Rainbow Bright, but the way that I told it was completely different. And that's your opportunity to make your mark as a team. How you tell a story is just as important as what a story is. Think about the game as a whole and how it's working to design the story experience. Because telling is how you connect. It's how you give. Thank you. Hey, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them and I'll try and answer them as best as I can. Uh, so is this game released right now? No, it's not released. Next year, yes. At that website is a newsletter you can sign up to and we will tell you when it's ready. <laughs> Any questions about storytelling, stories in games, um, narrative design? Yes. You briefly touched on the fact that I mean, the three-act structure yeah, has yeah. conflict and that you don't need conflict in games, um, so in story. Yeah. Uh, um, so like I know like the Eastern war and act structure which is like a twist. Um, yeah, yep. Things coming together. Like what are some other examples that you had in your mind when you mentioned that? Um, there, so there. Need a beginning, middle, and end. Yes, yes. So in terms of. Um, I guess it can be in the telling. You know, for example, you might just show. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but there is a certain Eastern storytelling way which does have a twist at the end, but where you can show a boy going to a Coke machine, next getting a Coke, next getting two Cokes, next sitting down beside a girl and giving her a Coke. There is sort of no conflict in that story, but there is a story taking place. So I guess for me that would be an example. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly an example. Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, just when you started like, exploring um, like non-text-based narratives, you got that very visual narrative, mm. were there any like, particular uh, areas of research that you did or any particular designers that you looked at? Yeah, we looked at a number of games. Um, Monument Valley was one we looked at. We looked at Journey. Um, we actually, you know, watched a number of GDC talks that that game company did about Journey and the colour that they used and how they told that story. We learnt a lot from that. Um, we were also looking at stories that were not necessarily the same 
uh, well, not video games, so we looked at a lot of fairy tales um, and things like that, but how they were shown more visually, like the pictures in them. But we also looked at um, just atmospheric games like Soma. We looked at Inside is another good inspiration for us too. There's not a lot of text or speech there, but it's certainly very atmospheric. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, how much conversation was there about audience? Yeah. You know, the rest of the team may not. Was that a big part of the discussion? Was it a bit of education? Early on it was because we were, before we were even talking about the story, we were talking about who we wanted to make the game for and why we made the decision not to have text or speech was very much for younger audiences and older audiences as well. And we knew that something about this game too, um, just the first prototype video that I showed you, I sort of had my little cousins play and it was... Um, it was so obvious to me that they were going to be part of our demographic as well because they just loved it and they didn't need a story. They already put a story on top of it, if that makes sense. They saw her cape and were like, oh, she's going to go on an adventure and she's going to do this and she's going to... It was just wonderful, you know. And I think that's great about games too is because they allow people to bring their own stories to the table as well, which is super cool. Yes. Yes. Um, so, like, was part of figuring out did you like create like a visual language so like certain colors or objects would be like motifs for certain things? Yes, um, yeah. yeah. That's always what I'm advocating for. Um, I was so, um, and some of it works different ways. So game design will say, we have a lantern and we have something at the top, you know, like a brazier. How does that fit into the story? And then I will think about how those things can work as a metaphor or a motif for the theme, which is friendship, you know, separation, um, thinking about how these represent memories between them. Therefore, I was sort of saying, can we, can we like light up the level a little bit? Like at the end, can it like be like, ah, oh, once you've like at the top and they were like, yep, that works for game design because the player gets feedback that they're finished the level. Um, and then also story, we understand that, you know, that particular memory has been, I guess, remembered. Um, and it's still going to take us a little bit to try and communicate that idea, but that's the intention. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. So when, you're doing, when you were doing play testing, were there examples of things that just didn't work, like people just didn't understand what was happening? Uh, in for this particular. Yeah, for play testing. Yes. Well, that level that I showed you at the start with the the bluish mountain and the lighting of the fire. We would ask people, what do you think this is about? And people would say, death, um, it's dark, uh, maybe they're in another, uh, like, a, like an underworld. And we were like, oh, this is getting really dark. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't want the, the game to be this dark. So um, that's why the Voyage and Return worked, because then we can sort of isolate those darker levels at uh, the end of the story and sort of still have a lighter approach as well. Because we also didn't want to be too dark. If that makes sense, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, over there first, and then yeah. Uh, how long did it take you and the team to sort of realize the limitations of like your capability as being such a small team for the narrative? Hmm. It it took us a while. I mean, it took personally me a while, but also it, it we were still working out. First of all, uh, the puzzles and game design has been a challenge in this game because of the challenge we set ourselves to do it in these 3D environments. And that has a lot of repercussion and also moving time. So um, you're moving time, the camera's moving. It took us a long time to work out that just getting some really satisfying puzzles was going to be really hard and telling a story on that <coughs> would be even harder. So we actually realized that we don't need to tell a super complex story. You know, we had very lofty ambitions of being really complex and actually we don't need to be really complex to be meaningful. And I think that took some time for us to work out. Yeah, yeah. So keep that in mind. You don't have to tell a super complicated story to have meaning and, you know, emotion and connection in there. It can be quite simple. And the telling might be what is the, the you know, personal unique thing about it. Yes. Visual language with the images, there are, there's a TV set, there's a chair. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. I want to know the story of the Orange Island and the people who worship the Max Ferguson. I mean, <laughs> are, they, are they there for us to just make our own I'm just going to take this back they, so we can look at it. That, do they directly relate to your story? Oops. Um, so some of them actually directly relate to these Lego prototypes that I built, like the personal stories. So we are going to put modern objects in these environments um, and they're going to relate to Arena and Friends' friendship in the real world. So that helps convey the idea that these gardens are sort of a, a mysterious, surreal manifestation of a, of a friendship um, and how these um, objects work to sell this idea. So, for example, the uh, red and pink one with the tractor was about a story that we wrote um, and where I described um, Friend. We wanted to show that he was really curious um, and that he was sort of, um, you know, from uh, his family were farmers and they had a tractor. He got really curious. Something bad happened to his arm. Like uh, he fell off the tractor and broke it in his childhood. But again, that was that's a really complicated story to tell. That's why he's holding his arm and looking at the tractor. Um, but, I, you know, we're going to have to be very careful about seeing if that little story is being communicated or at least using objects that resonate with people's childhood is another way that we can do that so that while you might not know exactly what happened in their childhood with that object, you have your own ideas and childhood memories of those objects. And that's where we realised we don't have to actually explicitly explain every little story thing that happens in here because people are going to bring their own stories and experience of friendship and separation and... Um, you know, childhood to it. So that's fine. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Yes. Hi. So, um, you mentioned before about wanting to have the characters hug. And yeah. How you didn't have the animator to do it. You didn't like that way challenge, right? Yeah. So is the um, kind of look and feel of the game that going forward going to maintain that kind of unanimated feel or it's kind of simplistic? Yeah, well, fortunately, we have a very talented animator who has joined us, Josh, and we are so thankful to have him. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I can get a little cutscene. <laughs> so um, there is going to be a bit of a cutscene at the start and at the end to convey running away and not running away. Um, and they're, you know, again, two sort of narrative pillars or points that we can pin the rest of the story to. So, yeah, I was thrilled to have him come on board. And then I'm going to have to be very um, strategic about what animations we put in to tell this story. Um, and we can work together on that now, which is great. So, yes. Okay, thank you very much.